Ahoy and welcome to Swords and Starships channel. I am Captain Garrett and I am here with your review of Terror on the Prairie starring Gina Carano. Directed by Michael Polish. Writing credits include Josiah Nelson. Let's get right into it. So... Overall thoughts, I think this is a great Western. Uh, I think the best style of Western is a Western that is grounded and, and spare. Something that tells a simple, so a, a simple story, but with nuance and depth and really character. Like one of my, f I think one of the, I would argue, I'm not like the the greatest connoisseur of westerns. I have my favorites, and I certainly have seen a few. Um, it's not like my favorite genre of genres, um, but of the ones I I've seen, I consider Unforgiven to be the best western that I've ever seen. And what I like about Unforgiven is it's you know, unlike something like Pale Rider, for example, it, it doesn't have a ton of bombast, a crazy amount of action. Um, it's actually mostly about a meditation on revenge and the horrors of violence. Another great film I liked with uh, Kevin Costner and Robert Duvall was Open Range, which was a very simple story about cattle drivers who run afoul of some outlaws and they seek justice. And there's a great conflict in that about the simple idea of uh, is, is this justice or is this revenge? So I think that the best, yeah, I would even argue the Mandalorian uh, worked so well on as Disney's, I think one successful and, and one well done Star Wars series because it was very much a simple kind of Western story. What I like about Terror on the Prairie is it is very simple. It's about a family that are homesteading in the late 1800s. It's a hard life. One of the favorite things about this film is there's a lot of just beautiful scenery and a lot of beautiful opening shots that tell the story without words. I think that's a, a great hallmark of an excellent Western is when it tells the story with the imagery and allows you to absorb the time and the place naturally without there being hardly any exposition. I mean, really the exposition is where we are. It's a snowy, uh, cold winter up in the mountains. And that tells us a lot. Uh, we're looking at a cabin that's obviously very DIY, you know, as it would have been in those days. It, it's not a lot of luxuries. It's got a dirt floor. Uh, it's nothing luxurious. So I would say probably the first thing that struck me is the cinematography of the film. I wanted to give this review uh, before I've seen any other reviews on Terror on the Prairie. Full disclosure, I have I do have a bias here, and my bias is in favor of Gina Carano. I think if you don't know the history of why she was canceled, I'll just give you the Cliff Notes version. Uh, essentially, she expressed her views on Twitter, and because those views did not agree with what the modern prevailing culture believes they should have, she was bullied and given death threats and hounded off of... Well, she wasn't hounded off Twitter. She's a pretty courageous person. She responded to all of the vicious, uh, mean, horrible attacks against her, which... Disney did not in any way attempt to defend her from. They did not uh, send a tweet saying, resist hate. Uh, they allowed the abuse to continue until the fire Gina Carano hashtag Twitter mob persuaded Disney to give in and fire her from the Mandalorian. What was it she did that was so bad? Let's see. 
She refused to say words that other people wanted her to say on her Twitter profile. I would think if there's one right every human being has, it's the right to not say something. Have you ever heard of the right to remain silent? What does that actually mean? It means you have... It's funny, I think people take that for granted. When people hear police say you have the right to remain silent in the United States of America, most people don't even know what that comes from or why that even exists. In most countries in the world, you don't have a right to remain silent. And if you do remain silent, the police can take you into a dark room and beat it out of you until you tell them what they want to hear. In a lot of countries, that's how it works. It's a very... Uh, it's an acknowledgement that compelled speech, speech compelled again, you know, being forced to say something against your will is evil and wrong. Now, whatever your views on the idea that on the redefinition of pronouns in the English language and how and when they should be used, Gina Carano was being without any provocation was being demanded by Star Wars fans, definitely not at all hateful or bullying Star Wars fans. She was being browbeaten into adding her gender pronouns into her profile as a show of solidarity for trans people. And as she has stated many times, she loves trans people, has no, has nothing but goodwill towards them. However, she did not want to put gender pronouns in her profile. She didn't really say anything about it for a while until she was hounded to the point where, you know, she was basically, it was attracting attention that she wasn't doing it. And so, because her strategy for dealing with hateful bullying behavior is to meet it with a smile, she thought, and you can certainly make the case this may not have, this may have been, this may have backfired. Well, it did backfire, but it may not have been the best approach. I don't know. I, I don't think it's fair to judge. We all make mistakes. But she put beep, bop, boop in her pronouns, right? And that was taken to, and as par for the course these days, any, anything less than fawning, obsequious praise and approval and agreement with whatever the prevailing left-wing cause of the day is, anything less than, than groveling on the floor to whatever it is they want from you, is considered hate, it is considered phobia, it's considered uh, words uh, probably I'm not even approved to say. They can say it, um, but I can't. So Gina was making light of what the bullying mob was trying to do. And then this was perceived as anti-trans. It wasn't. As she said in one of her tweets, uh, and she explained herself many times in great detail. That doesn't matter on Twitter because once the mob has decided they want your head, it's off with your head, and that's all it is. Uh, as she, she is a direct quote. She, in response to people taking offense to her putting beep, bop, boop in her profile, uh, she said, I'm not against trans lives at all. They need to find less abusive representation. She said her tweets had zero to do with mocking trans people, but rather about exposing the bullying mentality of the mob that has taken over the voices of many genuine causes. So I'm just giving you her response. And there was, I think the other really famous tweet was she shared a meme from basically she showed a meme that was referring to the Holocaust, and it was talking, uh, and the meme was basically saying how Jews were targeted during the Holocaust, but it didn't happen all at once. It started with turning neighbor against neighbor, and that the evil that led to the Holocaust and that enabled that terrible tragedy to happen was essentially the slow turning of one neighbor against the other and other, essentially othering people. This is what the post is, is about. History has been edited. Most people don't realize that to get to that terrible point in history, 
it was a gradual process. This was the thrust of the of the tweet. Look it up for yourself. Uh, I don't want to read it verbatim because it'll probably trigger the censorship mob, even though it's just stating the facts of what what was posted. And this was labeled as anti-Semitic. Now, how is a how is a historical fact and a caution about we cannot allow this to happen again. We cannot allow this to happen in our own time. How in the world is that anti-Semitic? I think it's exactly the opposite. It's saying this horrific tragedy did not happen overnight. And we, as free people, have to be careful and keep our wits about us and make sure we don't allow this to happen again. It's really an indictment of human nature. It's human nature that we are susceptible to this. Uh, we are susceptible to othering people and that going down a dark path. So I'm very sympathetic to anyone who's saying, you know, we're asking for live and let live and dignity and respect. And I'm fine with that. And I think, that, but that goes both ways. And I think that's the problem we have. The issue is not that in the case of Gina Carano, if she's saying something that is directly hurtful to people. I got no issue with people criticizing that. But if people are coming after her because of something she has not said, uh, that's, that's tyranny. That's bullying. That's harassment. So I'm on her side on this. That's why she got canceled. Uh, I am overjoyed that in this world where censorship is taking over the, the American mind and we are, we are being dumbed down into little robots that just need to believe the propaganda, follow the propaganda, do what our betters tell us to do, whether they're in government or whether they're these tech oligarchs at Google or Bill Gates, who's you know building his insect farms to feed us insects. You know whatever it is that these uh, modern aristocrats have in store for us, I'm not down for it. I'm a free thinker, and if that offends you. You know, I think you should keep watching my channel because uh, I'm interested in what you think and I'm interested in helping you think freely yourself and think critically and come up with your own ideas about things. And you're not going to do that by just going with a mob. So I've never liked groupthink and I don't like bullying, having been on the receiving end of it. Uh, I know how it feels. It's not okay for any reason. And the problem that we have. And this is, this is what Gina Carano ultimately stood up to. She stood up to a double standard. That's what it all boils down to. One side of the aisle gets to uh, incite violence, throw death threats, uh, literally accuse people of the most egregious crimes without evidence. They get to destroy careers and lives. They get to deplatform and silence. They get to do all of that. And if the other side even just even just attempts something like that, uh, they're getting absolutely destroyed. So it's okay for one side to be hateful and bullying, and the other side can just say, express their opinion, their general opinion, and that is considered violence, whether it is or not. So we live in a, in a double standard a perfect example is, you know, Star Wars really stood behind Moses Ingram of the Obi-Wan Kenobi series when she got three, at least three that were shown, three Instagram posts, which were terrible and awful, and they stood behind her. They didn't stand behind Gina Carano when she got hundreds of tweets, which are documented. You can find them online. Uh, th threats of death, threats of sexual violence against her. I mean, the most vicious stuff. Even if she were saying things that were abusive towards a community or a group of people, she wasn't. But you know, beep, bop, boop, to make fun of people trying to bully her into saying something, to, to just be, to just have fun rather than choose to fight, to throw back, to, to lob in kind, you know, that's her, her great crime. Bias logged.
So I go into Terror on the Prairie, full disclosure, wanting to like it. But I also went into it, you know, I went into it the way I went into really every single movie. I hope it's going to be amazing. I really hope it's going to wow me and blow me away, and I'm going to absolutely love it. And on the other hand, I know that I want to give an honest appraisal, and I want to give an honest opinion, and I don't think it serves any artists to just because you're invested in what they're doing to pull your punches. So I'm going to give my honest review, and here it is. Overall, I think this was a pretty good Western. I would say I'd give it 7 out of 10. And here are some of the things I thought was, were just great about it right off the top. Cinematography was fantastic. It was I love the way this was filmed. It's it's a classic western. The best kind of a western is a spare gritty small scale western that tells a simple story that has complex characters and complex emotions. I really like how they captured the setting. And an important thing to remember is this is an indie film. They don't have some giant Hollywood budget to just spend on anything and everything they want. You can see there's a lot of craft and creativity in this film. Nick Searcy was fantastic as the captain, as a villain. He had just, just was excellent in that role. I really like his character too. He was written really well. You've got to have a good villain in a Western and you know, so there's Westerns are such a, um, they're such a well-worn genre that there's nothing new under the sun. So whenever there's a villain that's particularly interesting in a Western, it's always a treat. So I was, I really liked his performance. Gina, for me, I'm going to be totally honest. I love you, Gina. And, and if you see this, please keep doing what you're doing. Um, but I got to give you my honest thoughts. My honest thoughts are this. Her, I, in The Mandalorian, I think her performance had, it fit her personality much more. The, the material fit her personality much more. In this story, she, she felt a little out of place at times. And she didn't quite have the depth and range I was looking for. I would say, like, the first act of the film, she kind of has this postpartum, almost depression affect going on. At first, that's kind of what I thought, because there's a new baby, and, you know, she has a, a son who's about 10 years old, and then she has, I think, and then she has a baby who, that she's taking care of, and she seems really down, in, and she, and it's, I do like how the dialogue is very spare in a lot of this film. People don't just fill up the, the scene with a bunch of exposition, except for the captain, but that's for a purpose. He, that's kind of his character. So you know, people were had fewer words back then. Life was hard. Uh, they really captured that. So I, I like that aspect, but there was so much quiet reflection in the beginning that I was drawing my own conclusions. And just based on her performance, I was thinking, is she suffering from like depression? postpartum depression or something like that and she kind of she is she kind of she talks about she's not happy with this life with her husband and that becomes more clear and that was and that explained a more muted performance where it ran into trouble for me was there were moments in the film where i felt that i just would have preferred maybe there were a couple more takes at just to just to get a little more emotion out of it such as when she's, or she's, I don't want to spoil anything for you. Um, I'll just say there are moments in the film where she's giving orders to someone and I wanted more passion out of it. I wanted more emotion out of it. On the other hand, what she is great at, and this is what she was great at in The Mandalorian as well, is the physicality. Like, when there is an action scene, she's great. When she's handling weapons, when she's just bearing down on a bad guy, uh, giving him the, the glare, it's fantastic. 
once she's in motion, you can tell that's what she loves, that you can tell that's what she excels at as an actor is the physicality, the challenge. I think the material that challenges her the most is when it's just quiet dialogue where there's, but once there's like real tension, you can tell how much she as a performer loves that and leans into it and is made for it. And that's an interesting thing too, because I think that's really why she's so beloved because she's very convincing as a, as a warrior, as a physical threat, as a strong, powerful presence. You know, there's characters, there's a lot of actresses that are placed in the role of being action heroes and we buy it because that's the world of the movie, but a lot of them just aren't that convincing. They just aren't. And, and it's, it's really a little more rare that you get female actors who, who really are a, a commanding, intimidating presence. You know, some examples would be Linda Hamilton in Terminator 2, Sigourney Weaver, Ellen Ripley, fantastic. The, I mean, those are classic examples. Gina Carano has that gift. She's very good at the physicality, at the presence, at the command. All of that worked fine. There is one line in the movie where someone says to her, do I detect a Louisiana accent? And she replies with the most modern American accent ever. <laughs> so it just, so she didn't really pull off the accent in a convincing way. I, I really actually wish they had rewritten that line, just get rid of that. Like, cause it, it calls such attention to it that she doesn't have a Southern accent or a Western accent. She, she sounds Californian to me. I, you know, it's just, or in that ballpark. So I would rather they didn't call that out directly or rather that they just just allow allow for the fact that this is not an aspect of the character or the presentation that we're going to worry about you know deadwood the the show deadwood on hbo famously used modern profanity in a world where modern profanity wouldn't have existed and they did that deliberately because they knew that the period specific profanity like, gold darn, it just wouldn't come across on the screen to modern audiences the way it would have, with the impact it would have had for people who lived in that time. So they'd rather that you felt the shock of the profanity, which is why they chose deliberately to use anachronistic profanity. So if her, if her, if Gina's accent is going to be anachronistic, just let it be anachronistic. I think that would have been a smarter play. But because that line is in the movie, it really calls attention to it. By the way, I don't think that's the worst thing in the world for an actor in a Western to not have the most authentic period accent. That would have been a pretty small critique. I think that, so what I'm really saying is Gina's performance was a bit of a mixed bag for me. Physicality, action, command, presence, when she actually has something to defend and protect, she excels at that. Where I think as an actor, I'd like to see her continue to develop and improve is in getting a little more depth out of those small interactions, the little things. Like when she's giving her son, she's telling her son um, to go get some eggs in the barn. That sounds like a small thing, but like just in those little moments, I'd like to hear more of the relationship kind of come out of that. So but again, this is an indie film. This is an actor who basically was blacklisted and stripped of all opportunity to grow or to learn. So full disclosure, like, I don't care. Uh, I would rather give an actor who has more, more work to do to get to a higher level, I would, I would 10 times rather invest in this actor then invest in 10 main Hollywood actors that are handed millions of dollars and churn out trash, even though they're capable of doing better. So I'm on board with it, and I really applaud Daily Wire for restoring some courage 
frankly, to filmmaking because do you want to live in a world where every film you see agrees with your political worldview? I mean, seriously, do you really want to sit in a theater where and, and watch and every movie you watch, there's nothing that threatens you, there's nothing that triggers you, there's nothing that conflicts with your worldview, everything is presented as exactly how the world should be and exactly everyone's opinions they should have and nobody gets upset and nobody, everyone is included and there's never anything that upsets me. I don't want to live in that world. That's garbage. It's bullshit. It's boring. So I very much applaud Gina Carano and Daily Wire for mixing it up and saying, we're going to invest in this actor, even if Hollywood doesn't see her value. And let me tell you this, Cara Dune is a great character. Now, was Gina's performance the, you know, out of this world in Mandalorian? I, w I would give it a pretty similar review. I think she was better in Mandalorian just because I think the material fit her better. She's in a futuristic-ish... I, I know, it takes place a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. My point is, it's not a historical epic that's going to require her to have a certain accent, that's going to require her to fit in a certain role. Like, she can be a badass st uh, rebel drop trooper in Star Wars, and that fits because she was MMA. She did all those things. Those, it is, it is a fact that even really excellent actors still need material that to some extent suits them. It, it, is, it is not possible for every actor to be all things to every, to every audience. They really do need projects that fit what they do. I'm not saying Gina shouldn't have done this project. I think this was a great stretch for her as an actor, and I'm glad she did it. I just think that the idea of her as a domestic homesteader on the prairie, that was tough, I feel like. I, I feel like that doesn't fit. She, she belongs, frankly, in the battle. She belongs in the fray. I actually would like to see her do more action movies where she's actually more in the lead. I think... I'm not saying, again, I, I like that this challenged her, and I think she should keep doing challenging projects, but I think she should also look for projects that naturally bring out just that boss in her, that when it comes out, and it does in this film, it's, it's great. It's fantastic. Okay, moving on. So, Gina, I love you. Um, consider all of that constructive if you see this review. And, you know, you might call this... Look, I'm not simping for Gina Carano or anything like that. Um, but I'm also not going to hide my bias here. I'm going to say I'm going to advocate for independent filmmakers and actors who, like, if you cancel people, I don't even care what their political views are at this point. If you're canceling people, I'm, I'm pretty much on their side. The, if you're canceling them for just simply having opinions. You know, people who are doing actual criminal behavior, like Ezra Miller, for example. No, that's someone who should be canceled because he's committing crimes. So that's a different thing. But if people are just expressing their views on Twitter and I don't like their views and I don't, and I have no, or I'm, I'm offended by their views, that's not a reason for them to have their career ruined. This is what's so funny is I think it's easy to be left wing and watch movies. It's easy because it's rare that anyone ever challenges your worldview. Try being a moderate or a libertarian or a conservative or religious or basically anything right of slightly left of center. And every movie you see is going to have five things in it. Well, not, you know, I might be exaggerating a little, but a lot of movies you're going to see are going to have things that make you uncomfortable or that trigger you or that disagree with you. And that's fine. That's a good thing. I think that's you should be challenged by movies. Not always. We all need some mindless entertainment once in a while. I don't begrudge anyone that. But I just don't want all of our entertainment to become this sort of vanilla, uh, watered-down just glue that we all have to just eat. We have to eat the paste like kindergartners. That's kind of weird. Anyway, what else is good in this movie? I really like how she's solving problems with what she has at hand. I like how she's kind of under siege and 
she has to use tools and improvise with things around her to fight back with very little actual ability. Her character in this film is not like a veteran warrior like Cara Dune who is capable of handling herself. This is this is a woman who is in deep trouble and up against trained killers. And I think that's one of the funnest parts of it is watching her solve these problems. There's a lot to be said for a film that has simple problems that are hard. Simple problems meaning the problem is simple. You're surrounded and there's no way out. How you get out of that is difficult and requires creativity and clever thinking. And a lot of writers can't write this anymore. You have Obi-Wan Kenobi, for example, with a this huge budget and their solution for how Obi-Wan's going to sneak Leia. Sorry, spoilers for Obi-Wan. Three, two, one. Their solution for how Obi-Wan's going to sneak Leia out of an Imperial base is he's going to just put his coat around her. What? There's no creativity in that. And you've got millions of dollars. You can hire the best writers. You can hire... who You've got all the CGI to help you. And that's the best you can come up with? Oh, he put his coat around her and uh, kind of... It's People are memeing on it because it's so stupid. My point is, here's this small independent film, small budget, taking a risk. This is a risk. You know, Daily Wire can't afford to lose hundreds of millions of dollars on projects. This is a risk for Gina Carano. She's putting herself out there. Uh, she's she's going to take slings and arrows just for having the temerity to exist as an actor still. She's going to take shit. So I have great admiration for writers and directors and actors who can work with something small and be really creative with it and really make it interesting. I also think there's some great moments for her husband, played by uh, Jeb, played by Donald Cerrone, I believe. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm looking at the IMDb here. They have some great character building moments with him, again, that don't require much exposition. You know, he's in a town and a prostitute comes on to him. And there's this moment where you can see some temptation and you're wondering what he's going to do. And I won't go further than that. I'll just say like moments like that are brilliant for character building. And I'll just say about the captain, the villain in this movie, right from the first parts in the film, he's excellent. He's you know, Nick Searcy is really at the top of his game. He is a classic Western actor. It's it just it's so effortless with him. He chews up the scenery with these great like religious quotes because he was the son of a preacher. It's fantastic. Really, the storyline is so spare in a good way, so grounded and down to earth. There's very little exposition needed as this you know, you you get enough about why he's doing what he's doing as it becomes relevant. There were a couple moments where I was scratching my head and being like, what is it these guys want? It's just not clear enough to me. It does become clear as the movie goes forward. I do think they could have done with just a little less mystery in the first act. I think that was a slight misstep, but that's a minor, minor critique. Overall, I really enjoyed that this, this is very much a real Western. There's definitely pretty gritty violence in it, like pretty serious violence. Some of it is shocking. None of it is gratuitous, though. This is the thing. There's sort of two styles of Western. There's the John Wayne, early Clint Eastwood kind of Western that is very much a crowd pleaser. And I think that it, and I'm not knocking these movies, I'm just saying they have a tendency, like modern action movies, to sort of glorify violence a little bit or sanitize it a little bit, make it, you know, it's pale writer, it's it's exciting watching him blow away all the bad guys. Okay. But then you have something like in the vein of Unforgiven, where every act of violence is given serious weight and what it actually does to human beings, both on the receiving end and 
on the perpetrating end and the cost of violence in the world. And I think that Terror on the Prairie definitely falls in the latter category. This is a, this is a film that prevents shocking at times violence, but it's never done in a way that is in poor taste because it is always with the idea of like, life was hard and there were some harsh, harsh realities in this time. And if you found yourself in this position, what would you do? So I think it was used very well. It was used the way violence should be used in filmmaking, not as, you know, not as an attempt to, I don't want, I'm not trying to get preachy here. I guess what I'm just saying is there's lazy use of violence and then there's effective use of it in telling a story because let's face it violence is part of the human experience it, it doesn't i'm not i would never suggest that we shouldn't have it but i do understand there's audiences for whom they don't want to see uh, a violent movie and if you don't it, like if you're if you have some strong feelings about gore this might not be the best movie for you but i don't feel like it's a lot it's just that when it's there it pulls no punches I, I'll just say that they bring the story to a pretty good close, pretty solid ending. It is what it is. It's a simple Western story. If you go into it expecting much more than that, a well-done, simple, independent Western. But if you go into it expecting, you know, Tombstone and, and a, or Pale Rider, that's not what you're in for. I think you're actually in for something a little better than that. Ending is great, and what surprised me most about the ending, not spoiling anything here, I just, I will just say I think that there's potential for sequels. Not necessarily. I'm not saying that it's, the film is like literally setting up a sequel. I, I just was surprised. Some films like this I sort of expect to just be a one self-contained story with no potential. I actually think there could be a sequel continuing the story. And I would probably be interested in that. Probably won't happen. I'm just thinking, I just was sort of delighted that there was that potential there. And it's very natural. It's not at all like they were trying for that. It just seemed to me that there could be more stories to tell here. So overall, I am recommending Terror on the Prairie. Uh, at just as a film, I think 7 out of 10. I enjoyed it. I've given you kind of my pluses and minuses where they are as a cause. And I think that's the other side of this. I give it a 10 out of 10. We need to support independent films that push back against cancel culture. We need to. And so I would have supported this film no matter what. I've given you my honest opinion of it as a work of art. But it, it bears mention that regardless of what your view is on critiquing art, you may say, no, you should critique all art equally. No art deserves more attention than its own merits. And I'm sympathetic to that argument. But on the other hand, what was done to Gina Carano by the, the trolls and the and there's a lot more I could go into, but that's not the subject of this video, so I'm not going to get into the specifics of what she went through. But I will just say it was egregious. The way the company treated her, she was absolute... They attempted to set her up for total destruction of character. And very few people in this world, and I mean very, very few, because just look around, you don't see it very often, would have stood up for herself. She stood up for herself. There's a lot of talk about strong, independent women and how women and girls need to see themselves in film and they need to see good examples. Interestingly enough, one of the best examples I've ever seen is Gina Carano. She literally had an entire mob of thousands of people hurling death threats and telling her to kill herself. And all, I mean, just horrible stuff. Go look it up. Go see the screenshots. It'll turn your stomach. It's gross. And nobody came to her defense. Nobody. Uh, there, are, and yet she has legions of fans. Go, go look up her appearances at 
comic cons after she was fired she has lines of women and girls and and i'm not just women and girls but fans but like girls bringing her drawings they have of her she's so if the, i'm just look it's not relevant other than to say if what you're saying is we need more strong independent women to inspire young women look no further so when she was enduring all that hell unlike most people who would have just bent the knee and and given up and folded and allowed hate to win and destroy her and and take away her voice take away her ability to express her opinion you don't have to like her opinion you could even think her opinion is bad fine but she's got a right to it this is this is the thing do we in this country still believe that I may disagree with every single thing you say, but I'll die to defend your right to say it. That's how I feel. Whoever you are watching this and however you feel about the things I'm saying, I am okay with your right to say it. And, I, and it is important to me that your right to say it and believe it and think it is defended and protected. And Gina did a great service to all of us by standing up for herself because she paid a very high price that few people would be willing to pay. And that is character. That's courage. And she needs, she needs good people to support her. So as a cause, this is a 10 out of 10 film. This is an independent production company trying to make their own things. You know, Daily Wire is not lobbying the government to get companies they disagree with shut down. They're not trying to send Twitter mobs of bullies to harass and dox and defame people who are saying things they don't like. They're trying to build new things to compete. That is the fairest, most honest way I can think of to respond to things in the world that you're not happy with. Be the change you want to be in the world. Stop going around and trying to ruin people just because they disagree with you. So if you're in favor of going around bullying, silencing, and ruining people who did nothing else but just speak their mind, sorry, I ain't on your side. But if you're someone who believes all of us have a right to free speech, barring, of course, criminal behavior, you know, you know the boilerplate on that. I'm not going to waste time on that. You know it. In good, if you're listening in good faith, you know what I'm talking about when I say free speech. People have the right to say things that offend you. And if you believe in that, like I believe in that, we've got to support independent filmmakers and independent actors who are standing up. Because when someone stands up for themselves and when someone faces the kind of attacks that would make most people, including yours truly, want to crawl under the bed and hide, when people are facing that, Standing up, they need support. And so I'm here to support anyone who stands up to bullying, whatever side of anything they're on. And that's all I have to say about that. So I hope you liked the video. If you did, please do like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. And in the spirit of supporting independent video making, please also subscribe to my channel on Rumble uh, to ensure my ability to continue bringing you great videos. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you out there.